Here we're going to consider fluorescence in a little more detail. Fluorescence is part of luminescence. Fluorescence is when you have a decay from the excited state to the ground state where you are obeying the selection rule delta s equals zero and emitting a photon. All right, let's talk about lifetime for a minute. Generally, we said lifetime is how long a molecule stays in the excited state before decaying to the ground state. And let's talk a little bit more about that. Let's define a fluorescence lifetime tau f. Now, I'm going to use some kinetics concepts. We haven't talked about kinetics yet, but I'll go ahead and maybe draw on your experience in introductory chemistry for kinetics. I'm going to say this is the rate constant for ra non radiative decay plus the rate constant for fluorescence. And what do we mean by these rate constants? Well, just let's consider fluorescence. And here we have a molecule going up in the excited state. We said that that can decay by generally two processes, a non-radiative decay and a radiative decay. So this we'll say is non-radiative. And we'll call the, and we'll say the rate constant for that decay is K and R for non-radiative. And this one, where a photon comes out as fluorescence, this will be a radiative decay. Light comes out, that's what radiative means. And we'll give this the rate constant for that, we'll call Kf. So we're going to define the fluorescence lifetime as the reciprocal of the sum of the rate constants. Note here we've ignored phosphorescence or anything else, so we just have these two general things. Now let's talk about another lifetime, a radiative lifetime. That we'll define, we're just defining these, as 1 over the rate constant for fluorescence decay. Now if we look at a quantum yield, quantum recall was the photons emitted divided by the photons absorbed and that is equal to the number of or the rate constant for the fluorescence so how many photons come out this way divided by the number of photons or the rate constant for non radiative decay plus the rate constant for fluorescence and note that if it only comes out by fluorescence, that means that there's no non-radiative decay for it to decay by, then this would be zero, and the quantum yield would be one. All the photons we put in to excite the molecule would come out as fluorescence. And if we use these definitions here, we'll say that the uh, quantum yield then can be expressed as the fluorescence lifetime divided by the radiative lifetime tau r. These are just reciprocals here. All right, so what does this say? This says if we increase the pathway or increase the rate constant for non-radiative decay, for example, by adding a different mo a di another molecule in our system so that now we can take the excited state fluorophore and put it to the ground state, we'll increase the rate constant for that. That means the quantum yield will decrease or this ratio will decrease. Or what does that mean? If we increase the rate constant for non-radiative decay, this fluorescence lifetime, I guess we didn't really call that fluorescence lifetime, but I'm not going to call it FLU lifetime, will decrease if you increase the non-radiative parts of the K. This we'll call as radiative lifetime. So that gives you a relationship between the quantum yield and the rate constants for the various decay processes and also the lifetimes, the lifetime of the fluorophore divided by the, life, the radiative lifetime here. Okay, now there are other ways besides the way we described here in which the quantum yield would come down. Here we've just said, well, the rate at which it decays, the rate constant for non-radiative decay increases and that will lead you to a decrease in both the fluorescent lifetime and also in the quantum yield. But there are other ways to decrease the quantum yield without using these so-called dynamic arguments here. For example, if we add something that will quench the fluorescence, quenching means a decrease in quantum yield, and if it does that just by, for example, binding to the fluorophore, so now you don't have the fluorophore being able to be excited, that would mean that, well, essentially you're just decreasing the number of molecules that are fluorophores by taking some out by adding this quencher, and therefore the quantum yield will go down. 
So that's a sort of an artifactual way to decrease quantum yield. So let's just concentrate on this dynamic way here. All right, so suppose we have a floor four and it's in the excited state. And now we're going to add to that another molecule, which we'll call a quencher, Q. And these two molecules will collide in solution. So they're moving around in solution, or they could be in the gas phase. And now we have a collision between the floor four and the quencher. And what happens is the energy that the floor four had because it was excited is now transferred over to the quencher. And now the floor four is now in the ground state and it didn't emit a photon. And here the quencher, which was initially in the ground state, is now going to absorb the energy of the excited floor four and now it's going to go up here and now the quencher is in the excited state. And this quencher in the excited state could decrease. Uh, usually when you add a quencher, uh, it decreases its energy. It goes to the ground state by some non-radiative process. But it could also go to the ground state by some radiative process. It could emit a photon. In that case, you have what's called energy transfer. And the, the light that normally would come out on this process, in fact, is, comes out on the quencher process. But in general, the quencher you're adding doesn't. In general, the quencher that you add and it gets now into the excited state decays by a non radiated process and does not emit a photon. So this is called dynamic quenching. And uh, maybe you can see this will increase the rate constant for non radiated decay. Here there's no photon, no photon coming out, which means the non radiative rate constant has increased, which means the quantum yield has decreased, which means the fluorescence lifetime has also decreased. So that's a little bit about lifetime and quenching. And also quantum yield and lifetime give information about the motion and the environment of the fluorophore. For example, if this is in a uh, not a very viscous solvent and is in solution, these molecules, the fluorophore and the quencher, will move around rapidly and the quenching will occur at a greater rate or a greater extent than if the fluorophore and quencher were in a much more viscous solution. So by measuring the concentration dependence of the quencher, uh, concentration dependence of the decrease in quantum yield or the decrease in lifetime as a function of the concentration of the quencher, one can determine how fast these things are moving around. Or if you know how fast they're moving around, you could determine something about the viscosity of the medium by which they're moving around. And the same thing for quantum yield if you have dynamic quenching. Let's take another example. Let's look at, oh, say here we have the ground state and here we have an excited state. And suppose this is more polar than the ground state. Excited state's more polar. Now we're going to put this into a polar solvent. And because the excited state is more polar than the ground state, the ground state will, won't change its energy level very much. But as you know, like dissolves like polar things like polar solvents. So this then will go to a lower energy. This will be stabilized. So if one looks at this energy transfer or this energy gap here versus this energy gap, if you have the excited state more polar, what you're going to do is to decrease the energy level, or that will mean an increase in wavelength, which will mean a what's so-called a red shift. So if one looks at the emission spectrum, intensity versus wavelength, if this is the this is polar solvent, so this would be nonpolar solvent, what you'll get is a shift to lower energies. Remember, lower energies is higher wavelength. This is red over here, and this is blue here. This would be the polar solvent. Now let's consider the opposite case. Here's our ground state and here's our excited state. And let's make the ground state here more polar. Now when we put this into a polar solvent, the excited state not um, not very polar, so or less polar than the ground state, so it's not going to change energy much. On the other hand, you're going to have a lowering of the energy because here we're putting in a putting in a polar solvent. So the more polar ground state will interact more favorably with the polar solvent and decrease its energy. So now, if we look here, 
Compare that energy gap with this energy gap. We have an increase in energy, which will be a decrease in wavelength, which will be a blue shift. In other words, if we look at the spectrum, here's the intensity versus, again, we're doing wavelength because this is electronic spectroscopy. So here's the emission spectrum. This is a not polar solvent. If we now change it to a polar solvent, what we get is a shift to the higher energy or a blue shift here. So by just changing the polarity of the solvent and looking at the emission spectrum and seeing which way it moves, you can say something about whether the ground state or excited state is more polar. And uh, one final thing about fluorescent spectroscopy. This was an emission spectrum and this was an emission spectrum. But really, what you can do is look at both an excitation spectrum and an emission spectrum. So let's just do that. Here's the wavelength, here's the intensity. And now what we're going to do is to just use a spectrometer and fix our, fix the light. Well, let's get a little technical here. So here you have a monochromator and lights going in this way. And here, coming out here, you have a monochromator. And now your detector is here. And this is your sample. So what we can do is vary the wavelength of light that goes into the sample. And now the sample is going to fluoresce, light's going to come out, and we can look at the spectrum of the emitted light here by adjusting this monochromator. So for an emission spectrum, or let's do an excitation first, for excitation we'll fix this lambda, this wavelength here, we'll look at a particular wavelength of light coming out, and here we'll vary for excitation. So we'll just sit here, we'll vary the incoming light and see what we get. Well, typically you get something like this. And this is in a condensed phase, so the lines are broad. We just get a single peak, although if we're really high resolution and we didn't have interaction with the environment, et cetera, et cetera, cold temperature, we would see individual lines here. But let's do a condensed phase. So there's the, it's called excitation spectrum. Now let's look at emission spectrum. For emission, we'll fix the excitation monochromator, and for emission, we'll vary the wavelength here. So we'll put a fixed frequency of light coming in here and we'll vary the emission spectrum and this is typically what you get. Something like this. Now maybe you can see really we need a three-dimensional plot so we have two independent variables the wavelength of excitation and the wavelength of emission and then the third in the third dependent variable is the intensity so really you need a three-dimensional plot but just let's take a slice in that three-dimensional plot. Now a couple things to notice this then would be the emission spectrum that there's a difference in wavelength between the peak of the emission spectrum or excitation spectrum and the peak of the emission spectrum this is called a Stokes shift. Why is that? Well, recall our potential energy diagrams. Typically, it looks something like this. That's for the ground state. For the excited state, it might look something like this. The excited state, ground state. We have the, and this by the way is energy versus uh, some nuclear coordinates here. We said that we excite vertically going up here to some vibrational energy level and then we very rapidly decay down to the ground state vibrational energy level and now if we go down here we have an emission so this is the excitation the excitation is at higher energy which will occur at lower wavelengths and the emission because decays back down here to the ground state and then emits this will be at lower energy or higher wavelengths so the emission will typically be at the higher uh, wait I'm sorry the higher wavelength the lower energy than the excitation secondly for a lot of fluorophores you have a mirror image and that can be also explained by this and what you get is a spectrum of the various energy levels going exciting 
and then you get sort of the reverse. Now we're going out here and looking at the spectrum of the emitting. So very often it's a mirror image, approximately a mirror. So the emission spectrum looks very much like the excitation spectrum. And if they look very different, what that means is there's probably some sort of excited state rearrangement, so excited state rea reaction going on. All right, so that's a very brief overview of fluorescence. It's a very useful technique in chemistry. A lot of people use it. Oh, one final point is that you know chemists deal with molecules and the holy grail of a lot of chemists is to actually look at individual molecules. Well, you can do that with fluorescence. The reason is that the current state of the art of fluorescence detection is you can uh, detect individual molecules. There's a single molecule you can detect. Here's an example of how to do that. This is a little old, but and there's better techniques. But this is a protein here. This protein is called aquaporin, which sits in biological membranes and forms a pore by which water can go in and out. What we've done here is to put a quantum dot attached by molecular biology to this particular protein which is now sitting in the membrane. This protein will diffuse two-dimensionally in the membrane and what you can do is use fluorescent spectroscopy to indiv follow individual protein molecules. This is the quantum dot. This is what's fluorescing. So there's a particular trajectory for a one molecule. Here's another one. There's another molecule. And the different colors just represent different protein molecules diffusing on the surface of this membrane. And this can be then used to determine the type of motion using is it Brownian motion or is it not Brownian motion and so on. But the point is Oh, we can detect individual molecules. That's the holy grail of chemists. Okay, that's it for fluorescent spectroscopy.